Good morning, church family. Welcome back to another of our online services on today, the 29th of May. Only two more days to go in May after today, and, and then we're into June, and it's winter. I uh, hope you're ready for it. Hey, um, we've got a few exciting things coming up soon. Uh, next Sunday, we have the start of our Renew Together series, which is um, like prayer and self-denial, and we'll be going through that uh, in the month of June. And to kick us off, we have uh, Alan Jameson, who is the General Director of uh, the New Zealand Baptist Missionary Society. So he'll be here next Sunday, uh, Queen's Birthday weekend, so it would be great to uh, to have you along to, to hear him and, and be part of this campaign together. And then the following Sunday, uh, we have our AGM service, so that's on the 12th of June, and uh, that will surely be a, a good time as well to uh, to take stock and, and reflect on what God's been doing, what he's, uh, what he's done, and to be able to celebrate as well. So uh, hopefully you can make that one too. Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes uh, you can hear things that are going on in, in our country around the world and often think it's, it's sometimes quite bad, isn't it? Um, and, and so I think there's some things that have happened this week that have, have been pretty devastating. And so it's at these times when... You know, we don't we don't look across. We we look up. We look up to our God, to to the Maker of heaven and earth. And I found this prayer. Well, well, actually, someone sent it to me, and I've prayed it before. But it's about being made an instrument of peace. And so I thought it was really appropriate for us to pray. So it's uh, a prayer uh, accredited to Saint Francis of Assisi. So pray with me, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace, where there is hatred. Let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Amen. It's a beautiful prayer, isn't it? And um, may the Lord make us into instruments of peace as we go about uh, our days and our weeks and years to come as well, because uh, the world needs it. And along with peace, um, honor is a good thing as well. And so um, I want to honor someone in, uh, this, this Sunday. Um, James had a, had a birthday during the week. It was on Thursday. And I'm not going to tell you uh, exactly how old he is. But um, as, as, we, as we honor James and as we come to, uh, to a call of worship for this morning, I'm going to read from Psalm 47. So let's read together and then we're going to enjoy our, our song together. Psalm 47. Happy birthday, James. Come, everyone, clap your hands, shout to, shout to God with joyful praise. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is the great King of all the earth. He subdues the nations before us, putting our enemies beneath our feet. He chose the promised land as our inheritance, the proud possession of Jacob's descendants whom he loves. God has ascended with a mighty shout. The Lord has ascended with trumpets blaring. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is the King over all the earth. Praise Him with a psalm. God reigns above the nations, sitting on His holy throne. The rulers of the world have gathered together with the people of the God of Abraham. For all the kings of the earth belong to God. He is highly honored everywhere. Let's honor God and continue to honor him this morning as we as we worship him together.
Well, good morning, church family, and welcome back to this, the last of our sermons in this particular series, which is based on a book written by Andy Stanley called Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at a series of questions we can ask ourselves in order to come to good decision making, which would in turn lead to fewer regrets. So on the first week, we looked at the integrity question. Am I being honest with myself? Then in week two, it was the legacy question with, with what story do I want to be able to tell? Then Rodney preached on the conscience question, paying attention to the tension. And then last week, it was the maturity question asking what is the wise thing to do? Now, in each of these questions, as we pause and we ask them, it should lead us to some good outcomes. Some of them might be immediate, some might play out over a period of time, but nonetheless, hopefully, good outcomes. The last question that we ask doesn't come with the same certainty that the others might have. It does require something of us, but there's no guarantee that there will be a payback because of it. And it's this, it's the relational question, which is what does love require of me? Uh, quite a few years ago now, I did an evangelism course. It was called Evangelism Explosion 3. I don't know what happened to Ex Evangelism Explosions 1 and 2. We blew straight past them, and I don't know if there's been a 4. But in the training for Evangelism Explosion 3, part of it was we had to learn basically a script. And when, then we were tested on it, and this test was recorded. Uh, and so the, the person who was uh, testing us would hit record, hit the record button, and then we would go through a conversation to see if we'd learnt the things that we needed to learn. So we knew what we had to say, and actually we knew what the other person was going to say as well, because we had read the whole script, and so we would go through it. The trouble was, when we had our feeble attempts at doing this with other people, we knew what we were supposed to say, but they didn't follow the script as we knew it. So there was no guarantee of an outcome. And this question is a little bit like that. There's no guarantee that someone else will play the same role on their side as you are playing on yours. They might have a different script. It doesn't mean it's not worthwhile doing. It just means there's no guarantees on this one. For this, we enter a scene that happens shortly before the death of Jesus. And before we get to our specific text, let me set it up for you a little bit. Here are some of the things that may happen, and you'll probably recall the story as I tell it. They are having a meal, and during the meal, Jesus gets up to wash the disciples' feet. All of the disciples, from John to Judas. Now remember what I said, that you might not get the desired outcome, and even in this particular instance, even though Jesus showed his love in this way to Judas, he didn't get the desired outcome. Ultimately, Peter objects to Jesus washing his feet. And actually, in this objection, Peter was honoring Jesus. To wash feet was something that you could do for yourself. Uh, you could do it, um, a slave could do it, but not a Jewish slave. It would have to be a Gentile slave that would do it. But it would never be a rabbi doing it for their students. Occasionally, if a wife, a child, or a student wanted to do it, this was seen as an act of extreme devotion, but it would never have been a rabbi that did it. This would have been considered too degrading a task for them to do. But if you want to think that this was a, a meaningless task that Jesus was doing, or a menial task rather that he was doing, look at the words that John uses just before Jesus does that, just to highlight exactly what Jesus was doing. He says this, Jesus knew that the Father had put things all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Confident, clearly, of who he was in God, that he had come from God and that he was going back to God, this was not a problem. And so this was a, an act of extreme love, that Jesus was showing to his disciples. But if you want it highlighted even more, in the gospel uh, that was written by Luke, he records a discussion, actually it was an argument that had happened at this very meal, on this very occasion. You see, they were eating a meal and a fight broke out. It was an argument, and it was an argument that uh, occasionally you would see maybe children engage in, 
very rarely, hopefully never, you would see a grown men engaging in this. They were arguing over who was the greatest. Now, you might have a discussion over a sports team, which is the greatest sports team, and, and you might pick a team from this era and a team from a bygone era and have some discussion about that. You might even have a discussion uh, on an individual level about who's a better player on the netball court or a basketball court or, or something of that sort, but this wasn't it. They seemed to be wanting just to simply compare themselves to each other, and this was simply a, uh, an argument, a straight up argument of I am better than you. So Jesus, the Son of God, in amongst this argument that, are, that had taken place about who was the greatest, he strips down uh, and he starts washing feet. Now, I don't know about you, but I would imagine that this would have had a stunned silence as he slowly went around the room. What is going on here? No one speaking, everyone watching, brains ticking over to try and figure out what was happening. Jesus knew that all things were under his power, that he, was, had, he had come from God and he was returning to God. So, and that sentence could be finished in a thousand different ways that we might consider better than washing feet. And so he taught, and so he commanded, and so he laughed, and so he rolled his eyes, and so, and so. But it ends with this, and so he washed feet. Jesus then predicts his betrayal by Judas, and if that's not a big enough bombshell, he then tells them that he would be leaving soon. Leaving? Now? Where he, and then he tells them that where he's going, others cannot come. And you see, the thing was, Rome could make people disappear. And if you're going to make the leader disappear, why not the followers? But what about this new kingdom that the disciples were anticipating? The one where they, they might get places of honor in the new government that he was going to set up. Someone on his right, someone on his left. And if not that, at least some cushy diplomatic uh, posting might be in order. But he says he is going. And then he says this, a new command I give you. A new command. They already had 613 commands that they were struggling to look up, look, uh, live up to. 613, and to that 613, Jesus was going to add another one now. And um, I don't know if they were thinking this, but how on earth were they going to live up to another command if they were struggling with the first 613? Not only that, but commands were given by God and God alone. Sure, over time people had arranged them, they had put them into an order, they discussed them, they wrote commentaries about them, but they didn't add to them. Because if you're going to add a command, that was a job for, well, God. So who does Jesus think he is? Oh, wait a minute. So he gives him a new command, and this command, this new command um, is right after he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. So he's telling them, I'm only going to be with you for a little while longer. With all the teaching that he had done, with all the, the, the information that they, they had absorbed with their eyes and their ears, he wants to leave them with this command, this most important thing that he wants them to know. If you remember nothing else, remember this. I've saved this one for now. I have shown you in the past, but now I want to put my actions into words for you. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love one another. Love one another. A commentator that I was reading a little while ago always thought that if we just love God, then everything else would work out. If we just loved him, that we would be able to deal with others, we would be able to figure everything else. But he mused while he was writing and he thought maybe we don't naturally love others. His writings carried on with the thought that if that were true, if we were just to love God, then loving others would come naturally to us. Then why did so much of the New Testament need to have ways that we show our love, that we show us how we need to relate, that we show us how we need to forgive? But Jesus wasn't done. He said, as I have loved you. Now, immediately we hear that we'd go straight to the cross. How has Jesus loved us? We go to the cross. But remember, when Jesus spoke these words, he had not yet gone to the cross. He would very, in just a few hours, that would be his experience. But when he said that, he had not yet gone to the cross. So in this immediate context, what had they experienced of Jesus in order to, that would have allowed them to understand his love for them? And of course, he has just washed their feet. 
So that would have been one example of how he had loved them. But perhaps if you could go around the room, each of them might have had an individual experience of how Jesus had loved them. Matthew would have been in the room. Matthew, the tax collector. Matthew, the one that was working for the enemy, working for Rome. Matthew was the one that would have been shunned by others and was shunned by others. So this Matthew who um, seemed to betray his own Jewishness and the Jewish state because he worked from Rome from home, this Matthew, who had been called by no one, was called and included by Jesus. I wonder if that's part of what he was thinking. Or Nathaniel, who said that nothing good comes from Galilee, and Jesus said, decided not to get offended by this, but blew right past it. Or Peter, who seemed to open his mouth only long enough so that he could change feet. Peter would have understood how Jesus had loved him. In this command to love, Jesus wasn't suggesting that they feel something. Too often love gets reduced to a feeling, and feelings we know can be fickle, and people fall in love and out of love. But love looks like something. It's an action. It's to do something. And so when we consider this bar of love that we, we, we work to attain to, Jesus sets himself up as that level, as I have loved you. He says that he is the standard that we need to emulate. Jesus is telling us that he is the one that defines what love looks like. I know that this was all said before Jesus on the cross, but his teaching would carry even more weight as soon as he had been to the cross and they start to mull these thoughts over. Jesus was letting them know that even though you've experienced love from me, tomorrow I am going to do something that will take your breath away. We know it took Jesus' breath away. They had little idea but in not too long, it's going to become astoundingly clear. But he's not finished. He says that by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, the word this is apparently a demonstrative pronoun. Who knew? Then, according to what I've read, it is specifically a singular demonstrative pronoun. You probably had already picked that up. What that means for our understanding is that this is the single clarifying marker for those who would be considered followers of Jesus. By this, this single marker would be the way that people would know that we are followers of Jesus. And that's how we love one another. It's just this marker. I used to work for a company that measured everything. Transport movements, average prices, you name it, we measured it. And I asked why we measured it. And they said, and the boss said, when you measure something, it improves. And so when we look at ourselves against this mark that Jesus had, we'll look and we'll continually improve. So Jesus, again, he inserts himself into this equation. He anchors this command to love one another, not on a previous command. Uh, he doesn't anchor it to a particular text, nor a festival, nor a temple, nor a day of the week, nor a sacrifice, but it gets anchored to, tethered to Jesus. Our authentic marker of being a follower of Jesus is loving one another as he loved us. And he said that we should do it not because he was God, though he was, and he could have said that. Not because he is powerful, though he is, and he could have said that. Not because of anything else, but because of the example that he had set for us. We covered this aspect a few weeks back in that text in Philippians chapter 2. That who, being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, his disciples wouldn't see him on a Jewish throne, but they would see him on a Roman cross. And perhaps then the words of Jesus, as I have loved you, were running through their minds. This question can help us with every imaginal relational scenario. Because so much of what we find difficult in life is how we relate to other people. But the thing is, we're human. And we need to help, have, have some help in understanding what a definition of love might look like as we keep going. Paul helps with some measure of a definition in, in the book of Galatians. 
And so if we're increasing measure with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and meekness and self-control towards one another, that would be a good thing. Or perhaps to the church at Corinth when he writes that famous love chapter. Now, Corinth was a church that had some significant issues. And into that, Paul is saying, this is how you should relate. Now, I know that this is a chapter that often gets used at weddings, and, and it's fine that it does. But it's not only for weddings. It's for our everyday living with one another. So love requires us to be patient and kind. It requires us to not envy or to be proud. It requires that we honor one another with a selfless love. It requires forgiveness and it requires that we protect and that we trust and we hope and we persevere with one another. If you ever get an email from Nikki, as, who's on our leadership at the church, at the bottom of her email, she's got this strap line, which uh, helps to summarize part of what love is. She, it's just simply this, assume good intent. Assume good intent. So believe and see the best. And for everything else, well, downplay that. So, one last thing. Don't expect it from others, but expect it from yourself. So with that in mind, are there some things that you need to go and remedy even today? A call you need to make, maybe an email that you need to delete, a tear that needs to be shared, a bridge that needs to be built. But in doing so, in acting out our love with one another in these ways, we are showing what it is to love one another as Jesus, our living Savior, loved us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you that you have shown us in clear and unambiguous terms what love looks like. We thank you that though you are God, that you came to this world, that though you should have been in the glory of heaven, that you came and you were seen to be hung on a cross. We thank you that the story didn't end there, but three days later you were raised from the dead and now you're seated at the right hand of the Father and that you continue to call to us. We pray that through the work of your Spirit in our lives that we will continue to be drawn to you, that our lives will continue to be molded into the people that you want us to be. And for this local congregation, we do pray that our defining marker will be that we love one another as you love us. For we pray this in your name. Amen. Mm -hmm.